that we are now on virtually as well. Good morning, good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to see that this room is pretty packed. I mean, respecting the COVID-19 restrictions, but um, thank you all for coming. Um, you must be really AMR aficionados if you come on a, such a pretty Sunday in Berlin to this venue and you sit in this um, former cinema. My name is Peter Bayer. I work at the World Health Organization in Berlin. And I remember when I, you, I came from Geneva, I moved to Berlin in 2001, I think, when I did my bar exam in, in Berlin and I moved here and this was still a cinema. So I, work, I used to live in Warsaw Straße, which is just around the corner. And this was one of the most modern multiplex cinemas in, Eastern, in, in the Eastern part of the capital. So now, I mean, I don't know, fortunately, unfortunately, this is a conference center. I think they did very well, but you can see that this is still, um, um, I mean, the, 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 the seats are still the, the ones that we had in the former Cosmos cinema. So welcome um, to this discussion on confronting antimicrobial resistance beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. We have a really interesting panel for you. Um, this is going to be an interactive discussion. So really I would like to, we would like to discuss with you, but also with the people who are following us uh, virtually. And um, we um, having uh, four panelists, I will introduce them later. And, uh, and as I said, if you have questions, I'll, I'll give the floor to you later, then you have to go to the mic because if you don't go to the mic, then the people who are following virtually cannot hear you. So you need to really stand up and speak in the different, I think two mics I can see here, um, speak into them so that people can follow you virtually as well. And then I can pick up questions uh, um, also that are typed in by our virtual participants. And then we are going to pick up uh, some of them and, and hopefully have a lively debate. We have one and a half hours. We'll have to be strict on time, but I think it gives us plenty of time to discuss AMR. And as you know, COVID-19 totally overshadows antimicrobial resistance, which we call the silent pandemic because it is less visible. Um, but we do, we are really sure that it's not over, it's going to come back and we don't see it at the moment so clearly, but it will resurface once the dust will settle. And that is also a question I want to ask um, our panelists, in particular also Lothar from the uh, Robert Koch Institute, which is the, the German CDC, um, to see what can we expect, what will be the impact of COVID-19. And also Sunita, who is in India and joins us from India today virtually um, to see what, what, we, what we think are we going to see um, once COVID-19 is, uh, is um, hopefully the pandemic is over. We are also going to focus on what do we need to ensure to have the necessary political leadership to address AMR. Um, we can see COVID-19 is very, it, it, was, it was a sudden outbreak, it, it was really, um, it came unexpected for many, while AMR is a silent pandemic which grows over time and it's less visible. But how can we ensure, and politicians usually often they react on immediate crisis, but they are not so good in reacting on things that build up over time. And um, how can we ensure that we do have the political uh, leadership in this area? And Sally Davis, as I think, is the, is the um, best person in the world probably positioned to speak about this. And she's very familiar also what the UK is doing currently during their G7 presidency. Um, the Germans will take over from the UK, the next G7 presidency. And we do really hope that AMR is going to be high on the agenda for the G7 also under the German presidency um, in 2015, when Germany um, chaired the G7, this was one of their flagship projects and the global AMR R&D hub who is sitting here in Berlin and I, our colleagues are joining us today was created also from the German presidency in the G20. So for Germany, it has been a priority for many years and we do hope that this is going to continue under the new political leadership. And um, we are going to lobby for that. So um, with that, um, Sunita, I think you can hear us and you can follow us. I can. I saw you on the screen. Now we can't hear you. You are either on mute. I don't know. Yes, I am. I'm on mute. I'm on mute. Yes. So 
So Peter, I can definitely see you all on stage and I can hear you. And I'm just very sorry that I'm not there in Berlin with you on stage. It would have been very nice to see Sally and to see you. Um, uh, but uh, as I explained, my vaccine has still not been certified by your organization. So we are waiting. So I'm, I'm here with you virtually. Sunita, I've already taken this issue up with our chief scientific officer <laughs> earlier today. And I said, Sunita could not join because we did not yet recognize the vaccine that you have been vaccinated with. So she said she's working on it with utmost priority. Good, Peter. I will see you soon then. <laughs> okay, very good. And now, Sunita, um, I would like to start with you. Um, can you give us a bit of an, I mean, what do you think is the possible impact of COVID-19 on, on AMR in India, in, in your setting? What do you see and what do you expect is, is going to happen? And also maybe tell us, that, are there lessons to be learned from, from COVID-19? Um, give us your impression. Thank you, Peter. And I think, you know, I'm not sure if it's so specific to India, Peter. I think we could speak globally on this issue because I think there are three big, big shocks that COVID-19 has brought to us. And that actually has a clear relationship to the way the world will and needs to discuss AMR. Firstly, I think most importantly with COVID-19 has been the fact that health is on the global agenda. We have always discounted the issue of health, public health, and we have always discounted the need for politicians to focus on health at the scale that we need to. But for once we have understood that such a small, I mean, it's not even a DNA, it's an RNA. And that has brought world economies to a halt. So the sheer, you know, what I call the revenge of nature at some level, I mean, I know it's dramatic, but it is, um, it puts health very squarely on the table. And that's the opportunity that we need to take forward when it comes to AMR, because you know, and all and people in the room know that AMR is that silent pandemic. It's not in our face today, but the fact is the lessons from COVID-19 have told us that the, the virus and the zoonotic diseases were also not in our face. We did not understand them. And then we have faced them with such devastating impact. The second thing that COVID-19 has put on the agenda is the related question of food, food system transformation and the environmental link. The fact is, that COVID-19 is a result of our dystopian relationship with nature. I mean, we can, we can still, the jury may be out on the final reason why we had the virus, but we all know zoonotic diseases are here and here to stay. And we all know that it's very much to do with humans' relationship with the natural environment, but also with the food system, with the modern food system that we are building and that we are working with. So I think that again, the link with AMR and COVID-19 is strong. We need to make sure that that stays in our minds as we move beyond uh, the pandemic. The third most important thing for me as an Indian and as an Indian environmentalist, Peter, and I'm emphasizing this is, Prevention is on the agenda. You know, for all of us, we as an environmentalist in India, we've always argued that clean water is the biggest determinant for health. But it has never become so visible as it has become during COVID. I mean, the first complete, I mean, when the virus, when the pandemic happened, and even now the whole question is, wash your hands. You need clean water. You need sanitation. Prevention, prevention is critical in disease management. Now this again needs to be brought forward when it comes to AMR, because for us as environmentalists in India, we cannot first pollute and clean up. We cannot first toxify our environment, feed animals with a huge amount of antimicrobials and then think that we can clean up. So three big ones. And then if I look at, the lessons and the agenda, 
I think the most important lesson that we have learned is that we have to scale up our response. And I think that's where this panel and your the efforts that everyone, GLG, everyone is making is that we have to get response at scale. We cannot anymore talk about some, some small interventions here and there. And I think that's critical. So if I look at the agenda going forward and very briefly, because we have an excellent panel and I just want to flag some of the agenda issues. To me, as an environmentalist, obviously what I bring to the table is the fact that we have a pathway for antimicrobial resistance that we need to be very clear about, which is the food system and the environment, which is something that is not often, which is now increasingly recognized as much as the human pathway to antimicrobial resistance. And for us, therefore, there are four parts of this agenda. Number one, it is that we need to make sure that critically important for human antimicrobials, antibiotics are absolutely not allowed to be used or misused for food system, whether it's crops, whether it is for food growing animals. I call this the conservation agenda. Just like you have a conservation agenda and everything else, this is a crucial conservation agenda for the world, making sure that we can protect those, that list of crucially important antibiotics. The second is for countries like us, and I think countries also across the world, is how do you ensure increasing productivity without the use of toxins, without the use of antimicrobials? And that again is an agenda that needs to be there, discussed, and we need to make sure that we can take it headlong. And that is what I call the development agenda, because clearly as much as we need to talk about excess, we also need to talk about access, we need to talk about development. And in this case about how do you increase food production without the use of antimicrobials. The third is to make sure that the environmental agenda, the fact that the waste from the pharma industries, waste from food systems is not allowed to contaminate um, the land, increase the risk of antimicrobial resistance. This I would call the environmental agenda. But the most important in this is the whole question about reinventing the pathway so that we can focus on prevention. Prevention is absolutely key when we move ahead. As much as the need for clean water sanitation is key for AMR, for health, it is key also for antimicrobial resistance. So I think we need to bring these agendas together. And most importantly, we need to make sure that we can keep the health of the poorest in mind, because this is really about making sure that they do not, they cannot deal with uh, a silent pandemic because for them, uh, the cost of health is already too high. So I think that is what I would flag off as the agenda going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunita. Thank you for joining us and thank you for these very clear remarks. And I, I'm not going to summarize what you said, but I want to pick up twi two things you said, infection prevention control. And that's certainly something we can learn from COVID-19. We were so we were so successful that there was not even a flu season last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, we managed to control all these respiratory diseases, not only COVID-19. And with fairly basic means, as you said, hand washing, hand hygiene, mask wearing. So some of these things, maybe we want to actually continue doing so in certain settings. And then you also spoke about One Health environment. And that is, of course, um, and I forgot to introduce you, Sunita. Nairon is an Indian environmentalist, as you could learn already, and a political activist. And she is the director general of the India-based Research Institute of the Center for Science and Environment. Um, and she is also the member of the GLG, and the GLG is the global leaders group of AMR um, that WHO has set up together with OIE and FAO to really look at a One Health response and to ensure also this political leadership that we are looking for in AMR. Um, with that, I want to lead over to Dame Sally Davis. She, you don't need an introduction, but you are the UK Special Envoy on Antimicrobial Resistance and 
Before that, she was for a long time the chief medical officer for England and the chief medical advisor to the UK government. And their AMR was really, really high on its agenda. I mean, that is when we had the Jim O'Neill report. I mean, you really brought it at the forefront. That is when it was introduced by the UK in the G7. Um, we had heads of states discussing the issue and that was before the pandemic. So, and, and now you are closely involved in um, what the UK is doing in the current presidency and um, we are working on it. So can you give us something, my, your experience on political leadership, COVID-19, AMR, what do we have to do? Where, where are we heading to? Thank you very much, Peter. So it's great that we're all talking about this because I think that COVID has shown us that we have weakened our universal health systems and that they haven't stood up to it. I think they've heightened our understanding of inequalities within countries and across countries, and we're going to have to do something about that. And of course, they've cost governments, communities, in families and people, a lot of money and a lot of sadness. And that impact on our economy is going to be felt for a long time and feeds back into what Sunita was saying that prevention is better than cure. And if we look at what's going on, there's now accumulating evidence that through the COVID pandemic, more and more antibiotics have been used, even when they weren't really indicated, yet poor clinicians on the front line wanting to do something, not having the good diagnostics, were forced into doing something. And we expect to see that AMR after the pandemic goes into being an endemic rather than is actually over infection. We're expecting AMR to have arisen um, much higher in most countries, and that's going to be very difficult. So what we've been trying to do from Britain is build through our G7 presidency on actually where Germany took us, not only in G7, but in G20, watching and working with G20 led by Italy with the Monti Commission coming in. And we've got AMR in three strands of the work. One strand is the health ministers who are committed to trying to improve matters and mitigate AMR. We've been looking at innovative models of financing I'll come back to that. But we're also concerned across health ministries about the fact that we might know where our clothes come from, but we don't know where our antibiotics come from. And increasingly across the world, not only do we not have access in some countries to antibiotics that they actually need, we're having stockouts of antibiotics that they thought they could get, and then they run out. And we need a much more secure, transparent, supply chain and there's work started on that and in producing those antibiotics and antimicrobials we want to know that we're not damaging the environment so the environment ministers have been working and i want to give um, credit to the industry amr industry alliance for already setting standards for environmental discharge for indian government for looking at whether they could have regulatory levels of standards so they chose to uh, consult on extraordinarily strict ones which may not be doable at this point but they are showing real leadership and we're going to have to sort that through the other um, strand of work in G7 that's going forward is actually led by the finance ministers themselves for the first time ever. And this is looking at innovative financing. We know we've got a market failure. Thank you again, industry, for setting up the AMR Action Fund to tide us through trying to bring um, through a billion of investment up to four new antibiotics through, but regularly we hear of small companies that have a worthwhile antibiotic that are going bust. So we need to improve the innovation. We need to make sure it comes through. We need to have stewardship. Let's recognize the Carbex stewardship um, guidelines. And then we need to have access all the time and for everyone everywhere. We need equity. And the um, 
G7 finance ministers are looking at how to do pull funding, incentive funding to try and make this happen. Yeah. Of course, in Britain, we've been, uh, we are in the middle of a pilot, which I can come back to. And then to kind of hold it and cap it, we had the heads of state um, and well, anticipating all this work and emphasizing that AMR stays for them a major priority going forwards. So as we hand over to Germany, the G7 presidency at the end of the year, we hope we're going to have some oven ready ideas for them to develop and take forwards. And we're all working together to try and make it easy for Germany to do that and then hand off to Japan afterwards. Thank you so much, Sally. And um, I, as I read in the newspaper, they hope to set up a government early December. So that would be right in time for the German G7 presidency and for the political leadership we are needing. I think you, you touched upon a very important area, which is, um, uh, which is the shortages of existing antibiotics. Um, and, uh, and that is becoming a real problem. It is not only that we have a research and development gap and I'm happy that Adrian Thomas is joining us from J&J, &J, one of the few companies who are still engaged in antibiotic development and, and also in promoting access to the TB drugs in particular. But we also have an issue with, um, with the, the generics. And, and I was just in Paris and where we have a project, a three-year project where we are helping the French government addressing shortages of critical antibiotics. And we spoke with the veterinary industry and they told us that the volume of sales went down from a thousand tons to 400, which is fantastic because that's what we want. Stop wasting antibiotics in, in, in actually replacing hygienic measures in animal husbandry. So they were really successful. They did what we want them to do. But what does it mean for the industry? Well, their volume of sales went down from a thousand tons to 400. Their production facilities are too big because the volume isn't there anymore. And if you, if you renew your production facilities and you see and your business head is showing you the, the volume of sales going down every year, and that is a trend over 10 years, which is going to continue, are you going to reinvest to revamp your antibiotic facility? No, you go to something which is actually more promising. So that is something where, where the more successful we are with stewardship, the more pressure we put actually on the, on the market and the more vulnerable the market is going to be. And, and it is of course a very rational assessment that the industry makes if they reassess their portfolio every year, what are they going to kick out and what do they take in? And antibiotics are unfortunately also relatively difficult to manufacture because of uh, you know, the, 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 the risk of allergies, you have to have separate production facilities. The injectable antibiotics are also relatively difficult to manufacture because of the sterile um, injection facilities. And that's something we will come to that with Adrian. But before that, we have, I'm very, very glad that we have Lothar Wieler. And, and because Lothar is at the forefront of the response here in Germany as the head of the Robert Koch Institute, and um, I'm sure that you had not many free weekends over the past 18 months. So I'm really glad that you took the time to come to join us here today. And um, Lothar Wieler is also very engaged in AMR because he used to be a university professor for microbiology and um, veterinary science in Germany. So this is really AMR is, is, is you know, his bread and butter. Um, so as the president of the Robert Koch Institute, what, what would you like to keep as infection and prevention and control measures over the period and not just stop and go back to normal before? What would make sense that we do to actually not only fight COVID-19, but also other infectious diseases? And what do you think will, I mean, happen with AMR in, in um, do you have any data, for example, in Germany yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for having me here. It's a privilege to be together with these uh, distinguished guests here and with Sally and Sunita and Edwin. Um, um, I'd, I'd first like to come back to the point, what, what did we learn when, and what, what uh, particularly um, AR can learn from this COVID uh, pandemic? And I can only echo what has been said by uh, Sunita and, and by you, Sally. 
But let me make uh, some additional points. And, and again, the, the most important point here is prevention, 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 because each and every infectious disease that can be prevented will also, of course, directly lead to less use of antibiotics. That, that's the very easy and, and one lesson. And that, actually, that's not a lesson that we had to learn, but a lesson that we that was knowledge already before this pandemic. It will always uh, it will always uh, uh, touch upon the most marginalized groups. Yeah, and and these people, for example, that don't have access to clean water. So, wh whatever we are talking about in in diseases, be it infectious disease or whatsoever, I mean clearly the conditions people are living. We have to foster the living conditions. We have to give access. We have to. We always have to take in mind the sustainable development goals. That, that's the key issue here. But in, in particular now for um, COVID-19, I think what, what was particularly interesting to see is that um, the surveillance bit, this is a clear, clear issue in the uh, WHO response plan, action plan for antibiotic resistance. You need sound data. You need a sound surveillance and it should be as harmonized as possible. And between the medical and the veterinary area, you need sound data. And I think this is a lesson that I guess everybody of you took. Suddenly, everybody was staring at a dashboard launched by the Johns Hopkins University initially, and then by other bodies like also the Robert Koch Institute. And suddenly, everybody was looking at these data. Visualized data, easily visualized data, easily getting what is going on. So what do we need is we need these surveillance data in a similar way for antibiotic microbial resistance, because then the issue here is politicians also cannot neglect it. Yeah? You see the magnitude of the problem and you see whether the intervention works or not. And this is the basic, you need evidence-based decisions and you can only make evidence-based decisions if you have data that are sound. And I think this is a lesson that we, we knew already, but I, I think I've never seen such an interest in one dashboard, basically every day, people looking at these numbers. So you have to ensure good data so that politicians can make their decisions based on sound data. That, that's, that's common knowledge, but it really needs to be done. So in addition, of course, and there is also this, again, I'm coming back to the sustainable development goal. We need strong and resilient health systems, of course. That, that, that's also for sure. But I want to particularly address, in, in Germany, we distinguish between three pillars. It's a hospital pillar, it's the ambulatory sector, and it's a public health sector. And this crisis is mostly has been a public health crisis. We were able to control this pandemic with so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions, very, very easy tools, very mass, keeping certain distances, uh, not too much crowding if possible, and with hygiene. So very basic principles, and we should, and this is a takeoff from me in particular. You know, we call it about, we call about health promotion, what, whatever name you find for it, but it's a chance to educate people and how you can really cope with infectious diseases. You can reduce the amount of infectious disease if you, if you act properly. And it has been really stunning that we worldwide were able to totally shut down influenza. Huh? There were no influenza waves around. I mean, the measures taken have been harsh, no doubt about it, and we can argue about this, but what it proves, it's possible in principle. You can, with right education and with certain hygienic methods, you can influence the number of people getting affected every year and every day. So this is a very important thing. Therefore, also, um, I, I'd like to call upon this WHO hub, where we have the data, the data that are important, the data that need to be globalized, that need to be transparent, that need to be transparently communicated, and, and decisions have to be made on data. And, and basically, um, the last point that I want to make has already been risen by the two previous speakers. Um, it is utmost important that health is not an issue of the health ministry alone. We know that it's in so-called all health in all government health or all in health in all policies. And that's, that has been shown 
um, intention, intensively, the economy was struck by this uh, pandemic. Of course, the health of many people was struck by this, but the economy was struck. So it's, it's really utmost important that politicians understand health has to be managed by more than the Ministry of Health. It had been managed by all other ministries. And this is an all in government approach. And this, of course, also holds true for AMR. So these are the, the messages. Again, I'm, I'm basically echoing what has been said before, but I stress these particular topics because we've learned them. And, and always, it's always easier if you really uh, experienced something than just talking about it and, and educating about it. But we learned the lesson. At least I hope that it will be a sustainable lesson. Can I pick something up from that? Because of course I agree. And I don't think the politicians have fully understood how lucky we've been with COVID. I know many have suffered and died, but actually in the developed world, the death rate is low and we've got vaccines very fast. As um, superbugs rise, we won't be so lucky. We have already seen deaths through AMR. They're going up all the time and there's new data going to be published soon. And we know that um, once you've got AMR, a vaccine is not going to help. It helps in prevention. And a new drug, if it's not there on the back burner with pharma, and we'll move on to that sort of issue in this discussion, then it's going to take 10 to 20 years to get a solution. Yeah. And so we've got to remind people how lucky we've been at the speed we could respond to COVID and how it's going to be very different with AMR. Infection prevention is essential, but making sure we have the right diagnostics, the right vaccines for prevention now, and start to pull through new generations of anti-infectives. And it isn't just antibiotics, as we know, resistance to first line HIV drugs, multi-drug resistant TB, all of these are real problems as well. A good point, what you made. The particular good point here is you are absolutely right. We were, of course, so lucky to have this vaccine because there is one particular antigen that we knew of in coronaviruses. And, and basically, we also already had the, the whole knowledge about this vaccine. And we mustn't, okay, we, we, we should make it clear to the politicians that it will not always be that easy to have such a vaccine. Because this is a good point, yeah, absolutely. We were very lucky. Other pathogens, we wouldn't be so lucky. In particular, in all the AMR world, it's of course much more complicated. It's a good yeah. point. It's not always a solution. We won't always have a vaccine yeah. 10 days, 100 days or so. Yeah. I could not agree more. And, and I'm very glad that you raised the point. And I see Adrian is nodding because he knows how difficult it is. I mean, and, and I can tell you, I, we had an evaluation of the AMR program in WHO and the evaluators on, I'm responsible for R&D coordination for AMR. The evaluators said, oh, you should learn from COVID-19. They, they had a lot of money and in one year they developed a vaccine. I said, you can't compare this. Exactly. This is absolutely different. Never, never even dream of having in one year, you can pour 10 billions into AMR vaccines and you will have none. So this is, it's the, the people don't understand the science and I'm happy that Lothar, you mentioned it. It is, the, we were incredibly lucky with having this, this simplistic virus structure, which made it possible to develop vaccines. This is not going to happen with, with bacterial infections. And, and that is also a very good lead over to, to, uh, to Adrian, because as I said, J&J, &J, Janssen, they are very active in TB, TB drug development. They developed betaquiline, which is one of the few innovative treatments that came to the market over the, in the past years. They have a successful access program. They are distributing it also through the uh, global TB drug facility. And I'm sure you can tell us also about the, um, the when, do you ex, when do you expect a TB vaccine which has similar success rates than the COVID-19 vaccines? Well, th <laughs> thanks for the challenge, Peter. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I work in, um, in global health in, in, in Johnson & Johnson. On, um, and, you know, we're, we're, we have fully invested in a COVID vaccine, an Ebola vaccine, you know, we work on soil transmitted helmets, that's intestinal parasites and worms that affect billions of children around the world, you know, endemically. 
we work in HIV, we work in dengue fever, which of course is climate change, which is talk about prevention, it's climate change, mm-hmm. and uh, you know many other areas. And uh, you know, I, I think um, if I look at AMR, and, and I've personally been involved in that for almost a decade now, um, it is really challenging because it's not one disease, it's not one pathogen, it's not COVID-19, for example. It's a whole variety of different pathogens. Um, and I think each individual pathogen gets lost in that. The second thing is, is you know, the a major challenge is, you know, people don't suddenly die. It doesn't shut down borders or transport or logistics or economies. It's not like a flesh-eating virus in, in general, affecting the general population. So it's it's slow and it's insidious. And yet, if we look at TB, for example, and I'm very, very glad the G20 is taking up AMR because TB is a big problem in, in the G20 countries, particularly in India. If you look at that, we have, we have one third of total global AMR deaths every year is tuberculosis. It's one disease, and yet it gets zero attention. It's also spread by respiratory method. Hmm. It's also a disease that has gone backwards during the pandemic. So whereas influenza, Seems to have seems to have been caught by the same preventive mechanisms. What's happened is that new notifications and treatments of TB has dropped by twenty percent over the last year. That means that people who are living together in tight spaces who don't have access to treatment and care and diagnostics are spreading the disease to each other. And because it's slow and silent and not sudden, we're going to pay for the price for this for the next decade at least. So. You know, I think um, these are complex. And the one thing I think that we should talk about at some stage, if not today, is what is the urgent actionable metric that galvanizes people around AMI? And the answer is there isn't one. It's not like HIV where we say it's 90, 90, 90. Or it's not like it's it's COVID where it's what's the R naught or what's the new transmission rate or the death rate. If you look at AMR, it's very hard. Is, is it avoidance of new infections? Is it safe surgery? Is it you get your chemotherapy and don't have complications? What exactly is it? And I think that's something that we should think about as an AMR community. If you want to get political engagement, having that actionable metric that the public asks questions about is, is critical. The second thing is I think a lot of progress has been made. And I do want to acknowledge that. You know, we weren't going to talk about incentives, Peter, but There's been a lot of investments here in Europe, here in Germany, in the UK on surveillance, in the US on, let's say, what they call push incentives around generating, um, let's say, collaborations in the early stage drug development. There's even been action around going to the more expensive side of investments from the industry in full drug development with the AMR Action Fund, and our company invested in that. But the reality is we need to start thinking about what do we do with these new drugs when they come in the marketplace? Because they will. And if I look at the experience we had with bedaquilin and drug-resistant TB, it was first approved just before Christmas in 2012. It's nine years ago. And just today, nine years later, is it really achieving optimal impact in drug-resistant TB populations around the world? Nine years later. So this is not like we all got 70% vaccinated in Europe or the US within five months of a, of a vaccine being available, this is nine years later, people are still waiting. And I think we have to address that and prepare particularly, particularly the emerging world for, for that. They don't have diagnostics. First new innovation in 50 years in drug-resistant TB is, is a major challenge for health systems to absorb. We had to have guideline changes. And what underpinned it all was really, I would call, cross-sectoral innovative collaborations. It's not something the industry can do on its own. So if we think about the challenge of cancer versus AMR, if I have a certain type of lymphoma or anyone in this audience does, we should all get the same treatment as quickly as possible and fully used. For AMR, it's only the people who absolutely need it should be given it by those who know how to, how to use those medications for the right period of time with the appropriate diagnostics. So as few as possible, not as many as possible. And that's a very different model, a business model for the industry, but also it's a real challenge on the front lines of health delivery. How do you say no to people who may have an infection? How do you say yes if you don't have access to diagnostics? And so 
I want to point out a couple of things that happened. We worked with USAID. We worked with the Global Drug Facility, which is part of the Stop TB Partnership and UN operations. We had guideline changes sequentially through the World Health Organization and local countries. And what happened is we drove a package of appropriate testing, background surveillance, protocols for use, medical education, control distribution, and access, widest possible access. And that made a huge difference. It means that today, if you have extremely drug-resistant TB, your chance of surviving is 80% versus where it was five years ago, where it was 20%. So one in five survived, now four in five survived if you get the treatment. Mm. But nine years of coordinated heavy lifting. I think that's what we need to see, Peter, is like, how are we planning for the future when these drugs are available of making sure they're used properly, they're affordable, they're available, we have surveillance and we have diagnostics. And I, and I think that's the challenge we all face and a metric that drives progress and focus. Yeah, thank you so much, Adrian. And, and I mean, as was mentioned, the difference COVID-19 versus AMR, you have many bacteria and they cause many different diseases. And it is not one bug, one disease. And, and that makes it much more complex. And I, I mean, you said in TB, it was so difficult. And still TB is fairly, I mean, you have TB progress in countries you can work with. You, you have a um, certain lobby of it's underfinanced still, but you have, a, you have a certain infrastructure around this disease. We don't have this for AMR. If we, as you said, if we would come up with, you know, fantastic new um, treatments for, for multidrug resistant um, hospital acquired infections, how would we make these available? And how would we also gather the data? Typically these drugs come with very weak data. So you don't know how well they really work in, in clinical settings, in real life settings, because these clinical trials are so difficult to run. Often they come only with data for urinary tract infections. So what, Adrian, I want to pick up. So what do you think we can learn from TB? Should we, I mean, you, are, you mentioned the global TB drug facility and we are pitching something which is along these lines for antibiotics to the G7. Is this something, is this a model to work on to make sure that people get access, but still we also, the drugs are used appropriately and we can gather the evidence we need to, to update guidelines, as you said? Well, I, I think you make uh, you know, some really important points. So at the time at which we have an, another breakthrough antibiotic for a drug-resistant infection, it's likely to be approved as a breakthrough on very preliminary data. So you're right, we're not going to have a, a giant phase three program with tens of thousands of patients have experienced. So we'll learn more in the real world than we will actually in the clinical trials. And that's important. The second thing is, it's very unlikely that that new antibiotic or that new antiviral or antifungal will be used on its own. It's probably going to be added to a mix of other partially or potentially effective antibiotics as part of a so-called cocktail. And so I do think that the, the, the advantages of control distribution, particularly with the global drug facility, is they also are a pathway for the other drugs required for treating drug-resistant TB. So if you access that pathway, you don't only have access to the new drug, but also the other complementary drugs, let's say. The second thing is then you have a protocol of use. And in the real world, and it was, it was important in South Africa, but also in India and parts of Asia, the guidelines evolved because of real world evidence that was generated over a period of five to seven years. And but in the hands of experts dealing with the most difficult patients and the most difficult conditions every day. We can't underestimate the importance of diagnostics though. I think this is a real challenge, you know, less, less so in the, in the developed world, in, in Europe, the US, Japan, Australia, other places, but it's a real challenge in the developing world because it's almost a barrier to access. And that's one form of equity issue. The second is widely available, fast and accurate diagnostics are a problem. And so we, we, we need to sort of think about that as an early infrastructure investment in advance because it's not present today. And if we saw what happened in TB last year, the same molecular diagnostic platform that's used for TB can also be used for COVID-19. Those machines were reprioritized. So that became a huge issue. I think is an important issue. I also think that we need to think of AMR as a public health issue, not as a patient issue. 
And the reason I say that is in many parts of the developing world, patients have to pay out of their own pocket for antibiotics. And so what happens is they pay for what they can afford. And when they start to feel better, they stop paying. And then you have a situation of partially treated infections becoming resistant because the person themselves feels better and there's no public health oversight. And I think for this class of antimicrobial resistance, we need to have a holding of hands, let's say, across health systems that says, this is absolutely a place where universal health coverage makes sense of some form or the other, but we cannot have the partially treated and the well-treated in the same populations together, Peter. And you did mention the vaccine for, uh, for uh, TB. I would love for a TB vaccine. I mean, people don't probably realize this, but over 2 billion people around the world have latent TB infection. That is, they have been exposed, they carry it, it's not active or causing disease, but with diabetes, with malnutrition, with HIV, with stress, with other infections, it can become activated and then they get active TB and spread it. And so a vaccine is of course the holy grail and there has been some progress, but it is nowhere near as simple, let's say, as, as the COVID-19 vaccine, um, nor is there frankly the investment in it. Thank you, Adrian, for this horizon scanning. I see, Sally, you are, you, you, it's short because otherwise I would turn to Sunita to go to One Health, but you have well, something. I just wanted to pick up, I think the TB story of Badala Quinn is inspiring, but as you say, too slow. But um, I think we need to think how we value antibiotics and antimicrobials. And we have this subscription pilot going on in Britain. Mm. And one of the issues in that valuation, and we're discussing the buckets of valuation across the G7 countries at the moment, is getting rid of an infection early so it doesn't spread and protecting other people. And so that's your public health bit. So I, I think this is a very broad issue that we need to put into our valuations so that we persuade people to develop the drugs, because we know that a number, Archaeogen, um, Melita, or whatever it was called, went bust, and Tasis has just got uh, its new gonorrhea drug working, and, and we're worrying about them. Um, but I think there's more to it than seeing it just as a public health issue, because I'm not sure that'll make enough money, and yeah. that takes you back to the metrics. For the health system, metrics that matter are how long are patients in hospital and out of productive life mm. and how many die when they didn't need to die. And then that's not bug and antibiotic specific. It is AMR broad. So I think there are ways that we can get at this. Thanks. Thank you, Sally. And this is something the, and I wanted to pick that up. I think both you and Lothar said, it's so important to have health in all policies and you, brought it into the G7 ministers of finance discussions. And that is where it should be, because it is about money. Uh, Lothar, you said before when we chatted that you have issues in finding the money to finance surveillance in Germany. And that's, I mean, if Germany, if the, if the, if the, if the politicians in Germany are not ready to put up the appropriate budget to do appropriate surveillance in Germany, I mean, how should it then be in other countries where their resources are much more scarce? And, um, and it's, of course, because it's unattractive. And I will, I will come back to this because I'm, I'm, I'm um, also with respect to the new WHO um, pandemic preparedness hub in Berlin. But before that, Sunita, I think you must still be with us. I wanted to pick up, as you mentioned before, you mentioned One Health and the issue about use of antibiotics um, in agriculture and, and, you know, let's say also in plants to a certain extent. What, and I mentioned this example in France and in certain countries in Europe, you can see, I know uh, Sally is usually, usually bringing us an example from the UK poultry industry, but there are, this is the swine industry in Denmark. Um, I looked at the numbers in Switzerland. The veterinary, so the animal sector in Europe has been fairly successful in reducing over the past 10, 15 years by changing animal husbandry. And because that means that they have to use less antibiotics because they have less um, need for prophylaxis and metaphylaxis. Also the restrictions, there are much more restrictions for use. The veterinarians, they have to monitor each time they prescribe or use antibiotics. 
So I have to say, I mean, the, the report of the relevant organization, Paris OIE, for the first time, they see a reduction of use and of antibiotics in animals across all regions. So, but can you tell us, I mean, in, in India, that is totally different. I mean, any button, animal husbandry is not comparable. Um, how, how is the situation? What do you see? What do you expect from political leadership? For example, the G20, should they set goals for reduction as we can see in climate change? Very good question, Peter. But if I may, before this, just add my voice to the TB issue. I think, you know, the irony, Peter, and I think for all of us in this room, I think this, the, the, the sadness and, you know, um, is the fact that, you know, TB is ultimately in my part of the world and across the world seen as a disease of the poor. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and that's why it really not, doesn't get focus. It's only when COVID became the disease of the rich mm -hmm. that suddenly we started talking about health. We started getting aware about, you know, the fact that even the rich were affected, not just the poor. And I think it's important for us to keep that in mind because in an inequitable world, we will never be safe. And I think that's the fundamental issue that we need to keep in mind. I mean, today the vaccine inequity is telling us that we are really fighting a deadly war between the virus, the variant and the rates of vaccination. And we know in our part of the world that, you know, COVID is as much a disease of the urban, densely populated rich as much as it is about the poor who live in very insanitary conditions. So I think it's important for us to keep that in mind and to know that, you know, this is a moment when we need to learn the lessons from TV to say that, listen, COVID taught us that we have to be thinking about that interdependent world where we cannot have inequity. And the biggest, biggest issue that COVID really brought out is the fact that it is the failure of the public health system. I mean, Adrian talked about that, and I just want to emphasize that it is about basic public health. And I think that's wherever the countries have failed on COVID management is because their public health systems, their primary public health systems were actually weak. It wasn't tertiary systems, primary systems. And I think that really brings us back to the whole question about AMR, to the whole question about access to antibiotics and therefore the rational use and the careful use of antibiotics as well. Now, let me get back to the question that you actually asked me, Peter. And I have some disagreement with these, uh, with these assumptions. I have seen the OIE report and I think, I think we are just jumping too much to believe that the intense um, food uh, systems, um, intensive food systems of Europe have actually done better than Indian systems. Actually, India on antibiotic use is much better than Europe. And let's, let's not have a class system over here, okay? Because your, India still does not have an intensive food production system. Mm -hmm. We may, we are moving towards it, but we don't have it today. And therefore, we are not misusing antibiotics at the rate that Europe, the US and others do. So we need to make sure even in Europe, all data is today showing that when growth promoters have gone down, the use of antimicrobials for prevention for what OIE calls prevention, which is not prevention, it is not therapeutic, it is not disease management, it is just prevention. And it's all about the way we are growing our food. And so let's not, this dialogue should not become a climate change dialogue where we have the rich preaching to the poor and that creates an extremely poor conversation. You get a conversation of the deaf and the dumb. This AMR dialogue has to happen as equals. Mm -hmm. We're all in it together. Our food systems need reinvention. We should not go the European way in terms of intensive food farming. We need to learn today because it is in our best interest, but Europe also needs to learn. So let's not at any, have any illusions that Europe or the US are better than India when it comes to antimicrobial use in food producing 
animals. So I have Thank to pick you. up there. Yeah, but I have, I have been to two farms only, one in the Netherlands and one in Britain, pig farms, and both of them used very little antibiotic. They had changed how they did things. The Dutch one was particularly interesting because they thought about what would make for the best welfare of the pigs. And they, they lived in an amazing environment with flushing lavatories. I can explain how it works with water levels and things and used very little. It costs more, that sort of intensive farming, and they charge more. So I think, Sunita, there are farms that are doing it really well. Um, there may be farms that are doing less well. I can't uh, answer for those, but I just want to put on record that it's not all bad in Europe. Peter, uh, Peter can I just uh, react? No, absolutely, Sally. It's not all bad in Europe. All Europe is not bad under any circumstances. <laughs> but then it's not all bad in India as well. Okay. Yeah. There's and huge eff effort for ethnomedicine in India. Massive uh, dairy farmers are talking about how they can uh, stop the use of antibiotics for food producing cattle, and cattle is a livelihood issue in India. There's a lot of discussion. I think we, and I agree with you, Sally, we need to emphasize the good that is happening. I'm only making the point that don't generalize the bad. Don't make it into Europe is good and India is bad. We need to learn and Europe is more bad. Europe has not moved ahead under any circumstances. I have enough data to show you the intensive farming systems in Europe and just how bad they are in the use of antimicrobials. Thank you, Sunita, for this. I think this is really, I mean, I, you know, no, no, I, there was, I think there was no intention to say who is bad and who is no, good. No, 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 I know that, I know um, that. I, but I think it's really important. And it also shows that basically it comes back to the data, what Lothar said. We are missing also a lot of data. And I totally agree with you. I mean, in Germany, now we have a massive overproduction of pork because they can't export anymore to China because they have the African swine fever reach Germany, which was foreseeable because it was in Poland. So, I mean, it is, uh, it is, a, is it a pandemic among the swine? I mean, it moved into Germany, so they can't export anymore. Now they are sitting off literally thousands, millions of tons of pork meat they can't sell and they need to dump on the market. And that is certainly not what we want to see basically neither for AMR nor for climate change. Um, and um, I really like this discussion because it shows that it is also important that we work on it together across the different countries and across the different sectors. Because what I also sometimes see, and that's why I want the point I want to make is, we often as the human sector, we say, oh, the veterinarians, they need to be more careful. While in reality, as I said, if you look at the numbers in some countries in Europe, they did, I mean, they were able to reduce because they were massively abusing antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Then it's of course always, if your baseline is that bad, then it's easier to reduce. But at least they did something. While in the human sector, let's say in my area where I live in Switzerland, you know, the, 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 the graph is flat. There's no reduction in use in antibiotics. And every single prescription me or my children got in Switzerland for antibiotics is wrong. Every single prescription. Either it was not warranted or it was the wrong antibiotics. They were prescribed not in line with the guidelines. So, and that, if that you see that in Switzerland and you can see it's also cultural. I live in the French speaking part where people love, I mean, I generalize. They like taking pills, like in France, while the German speaking part is much more conservative. They don't like taking medicine so much. They rather say, oh, wait, came alone, came, came on its own, will go away. So I think it's, it's a really interesting um, discussion we have. And with that, I want to ask the public whether anybody wants to make a short contribution, go to the mic, and then I will see you, please. Is that pretty correct? No. Alexandra, I would like to from the European Medical Students Association. I just wanted to add on to that about what you've just said about overprescribing and about prescribing the wrong antibiotics. That the One Health approach, in our opinion, also should include the medical students, but the healthcare students in general, because there really is a disconnect. We are apparently, as is apparent, not learning what we should be prescribing, and to people who are in this room, 
tend to be the people who are interested in the topic. They tend to be the people who are, you know, want to learn more, but those are not the people that we necessarily need to reach. So what we would like to just underline is that it may be worth, or that we would appreciate to be included in the discussions. And I think I could speak for all healthcare students associations in that matter, to just also reach out to the people who will be doing the prescribing in the future. And that we were also closely collaborating with the veterinary students in that regard and have had this, these discussions with them as well. But this is an issue which has been going on for a long while. This is an issue which will continue for a very, very long time after COVID as well, which will affect us in this prescription management as well. So we just wanted to add that onto what you were saying, which I think tied in quite well with the One Health approach and also just the educational aspect of it. Thank you. So, of course, really inspiring was the medical students, the veterinary students, the pharmaceutical students yes. and others holding just before Christmas last year a three day AMR summit, bringing all of you in. And I understand you're holding another this winter. So thank you for doing that and the leadership that you're showing. We do need to. And pharmacists are a key bit of this as well. Also in terms of, sorry, if I may, also in terms of just uh, reaching out to the public and reaching different levels of society, we have been speaking also, you, you have mentioned the problematics of reaching out about AMR to the public as compared to the problems with COVID-19 and deadly, dead, very apparently deadly viruses because the understanding isn't necessarily there. The numbers aren't necessarily as frightening, so to speak. There's mm. not an R number, There's, it's a little bit different. But the outreach programs from the different associations, also including maybe patient forums and also CPME and the World Medical Association and all these organizations, the connection of those together, I think, would really, really be worthwhile in the future and would really help us to move along and to actually tackle this issue from the root up and educational aspects as well as education of the public as well. Thank you. And if I may add, I do think that nursing schools is really essential and infection prevention control, because as was mm -hmm. said, I mean, many of these hospital acquired infections should be prevented. Um, I wanted to give you, and, and picking up again on Sunita, um, you know, I met like two years ago, I had a discussion with the health attaché from Ethiopia, and it was exactly on the issue that you said, uh, Sunita, and it was about, you know, oh, we have to restrict the use of antibiotics, stewardship, appropriate use in animals and humans. And he said, you know what? I give you a story. It is like if you have a big bowl full of cookies, you know, and you, you meaning the Europeans and the US and Australia, Japan, you ate them all and there are only three left. And now you come to me, I didn't get any cookie yet. You tell me I can't get any of these three. I have to share with you. That's not okay. And that's the same like climate change. And that is how people, that is the perspective when you, when now, after we abuse this precious resource for ages, we go to them and say, oh, 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 you need to be careful. Don't do what we did. And you shouldn't, you should use them with care. So it is, it, it is also something where we have to be very, I mean, uh, sensitive about how do the messages get across. And, and of course, the R&D pharmaceutical industry sits mostly in, in developed countries. This is different for the generic industry. But still, I think it is in really, and if we don't get over this point and we come to an agreement with the health attaché from Ethiopia, we are not going to get anywhere because we are only going to succeed if we all work on this. As like COVID-19, pandemic is over when it's over in the last country, not when it's over in Germany. And, and I think that's something where I also have to say the World Health Summit is for me a summit which is too German to be a World Health Summit because I see actually most of us are from Germany or Europe and I uh, do think that in the next years we need to really expand on actually getting people from other parts of the world and even I think for example from France I rarely see people coming to the World Health Summit. Um, with that, I wanted to go back to the surveillance thing, Lothar. I mean, now we have this, you mentioned the WHO global, uh, the WHO pandemic hub here in, in Berlin. And we are having this specific, the, the special World Health Assembly end of November that is going to discuss the options about a pandemic treaty. Do we need a new global instrument to manage pandemics in the future? A treaty is one option that is on the table. And we working for AMR, many of us are asking, oh, 
So is then this only focusing on viral infections or is this including bacterial infections? And what is the criterion? Do we, should, because not, should we have a surveillance system which is not separate between bacteria and viral diseases, but covering everything? What is, what is your vision on this? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And my vision on this is very simple. Um, it should be a generic, a generic technology that, of course, could be used for as many as possible pathogens that we can look for. And basically, currently, this is genomic surveillance. So it's basically unraveling of the genomes of these pathogens. Technology that is really at hand. It is uh, cheap enough to really um, um, roll it out in, 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 in all different parts of the world. And in particularly, it is based on four digits only. Yeah, it's two base pair, four base pairs that are shared by all different pathogens, and uh, so you can easily make out a lot of information of these four digits, these four base pairs. So what you need is the technology, which is is at hand, and the money to bring it in the world is, to my understanding, also at hand. So what you need then is the different hubs that bring this data together and, and make sense of the data. And this in times of digitization is even more easy because you can, uh, uh, you can on, the, on the particular spot, you can unravel the sequence of this particular pathogen that you're looking for. And on any other part of the world through, through digitization, you can uh, analyze this data. And so from my, I, I mean, we are, at the Robert, as the Robert Koch Institute, we are um, very much involved in, in setting up this, this hub because we obviously are an entity. The, the, the core of business of public health institutes worldwide is surveillance. So we have a lot of knowledge in there. And, and of course, we also have, as many others have, strong bioinformatics. But if you bring these together, and the idea of the hub is, to my understanding, it's located in Berlin. Okay, it must be located in some place on the world, wherever it is. I don't mind whether it's in Berlin or otherwise, but there has to be a, a, a place. But then people have to be deployed from all over the world. The technology has to be shared. The knowledge has to be shared. And uh, I consider this um, um, a, a great step in terms of Germany's um, in, in involvement in global health as a at least currently trusted partner for many other countries. But the, the, the whole idea of the hub is to bring this certain technology all over the world to support people and to learn from each other. And therefore, I think generic technology, and this is currently genomic analysis. And, and I would be more than disappointed if AMR pathogens wouldn't be on the list of those who are we are looking what we are looking for to be very clear here and and it's a generic technology we need it everywhere i mean we even haven't set, read it up in, in germany which is really frustrating yeah the first genomic uh, surveillance we set up in germany was for covid for sars cov which is really frustrating you know we 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 asking for this since more than 10 years because there are so many pathogens at least in germany we should have looking at at the uk and and uh, in particular uk you can see how much knowledge you can get out of this data. And it's easily doable. Uh, I, I, I can only, there are so, I mean, there are people around the world that are great bioinformaticians in, in so many countries, and, and uh, we just have to make it happen. And I'm glad that WHO took this initiative, and I hope it is understood as a global initiative that we all profit from. Well, I think we are all delighted that Germany is hosting this with WHO. And I absolutely agree. And one example I can give is through the Fleming Fund, which is an overseas development as, um, assistance fund. We support surveillance for AMR uh, in 24 countries, the development of the laboratories across the world. And in South Africa, they had the genomic technology, so they pivoted to COVID. Mm. And it just shows how you need these generic technologies and then you pivot as you need. And, the, uh, and we all need to share the data and let all our researchers go at it. So fantastic that you're doing it. Yeah, and I, and I think it's, it is one of these areas which is very technical, which is not very sexy for politicians. Yeah, but they understood but it. After they COVID. understood it, not okay. Really, they understood yeah. it. So that is good, you explained them. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean... Well, you will have to redo with a new government, huh, I fear. Yeah, but but exactly, as I mentioned, it's always for academics, it's, it's pretty easy to to explain why something is important or not. But you have to you have to smell it, you have to eat it, you have to feel it. And they understood that uh, variants of concern make a difference here. Yeah, It's really a difference whether you have an alpha or a delta variant mm. in terms of R dot. And, and, and they understood that the genome of a pathogen gives it a new biological features. Yeah. And you can you can analyze these features and, and make sense of the information. And this is what was understood because it happened in real time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think what really is um, amazing, why did we get all these vaccines and diagnostics very quickly? Because the gene sequences were available. They were available to everybody. They were publicly available on GIS-8. So people, mm -hmm. industry, um, J and J could actually they had access to to gene sequences of the virus that came from outbreaks all over the world. And if you compare this to MERS coronavirus, which came originally from Saudi Arabia, what happened back then is that a doctor from Saudi Arabia sent a tissue sample to a university in the Netherlands who isolated the virus and then filed a patent on the virus. And if you file a patent application, the patent application is not disclosed for six months because it is there's a certain lapse in time. So basically you were waiting and waiting because this wasn't published. And if you publish it early, it destroys the, 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 the new, you will only get a patent if something, if, the, if this is innovative and new. So you can't publish before you file for the patent. So this is, so, I mean, it was so much better for COVID-19, and this is what we need. We need to have gene sequences that there's nothing in a global database accessible to all with certain conditions for use. And then, and then the people um, who are working on the, the various tools, they can actually use the gene sequences to, to develop um, countermeasures. Um, Adrian, you want to, to, to pick up on this? Is that something? Well, no, just, just to underscore that, we went from gene sequences to finishing trials in 12 months. And not just us, I mean, the, the, the a number of industry partners working with academia and government did that. You know, that, that just shows what's possible you know, if you have that early pre-competitive sharing of information and the drive around it. And I fully agree with the deployment of, of generic technologies. I'm, I'm not sure it's so simple, the agreement from different governments and regions to share that information, but... It, it should be the easiest low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. But then we have to make rules that it's shared. You know, this yeah. is the, the, the so we're back to the pandemic yeah. treaty, yeah. which ah. uh, I think all of us recognise is needed. And we would say from the Global Leaders Group that it's essential that antimicrobial resistance is a part of that pandemic treaty as it's developed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think, I mean, whether it's a pandemic treaty or whether it's the revision of the international health regulations or both, or whether it's another kind of instrument, it just needs to cover all the pathogens that actually have pandemic potential. And it will have to be One Health. So WHO no. can't do this on their own. They have to have FAO and OIE in that negotiation from the beginning to make sure that we really, and probably a UN Environment Programme, that we make it right this time and don't have to tinker with it. Good point. I take this back home. Yeah. I was Sally. hoping you would. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure you told Tedros already. I have. Yeah. Okay, I have um, a contribution from the from the online chat, but if anybody has a um, remark or, or question, we have 15 minutes left. So um, somebody posted on the chat that the reduction um, strategy in animal production and antibiotics in Germany, because it did not um, uh, differentiate between which antibiotics actually um, led to a shift of using more critically important antibiotics for humans. Um, and reduce the use of those antibiotics that are not so critically important. So I think it's also important to say when you want to reduce use in animals, you should reduce in particular the use of those antibiotics that are critically important for human 
health. And that is a list that we are managing in my team and we are now embarking on, on, re, on a revision and we are going to look into this and we're looking um, at this with a group of experts um, from all over the world and, and to make this a really useful tool. I'm Jeff, looking I may to, come in? Yes, please. And then I look into the room whether there are any questions. Peter, if I may just come in very briefly on this, uh, just to say that, you know, my organization, CSC, Center for Science and Environment in Delhi, we actually just looked at the three organizations, uh, OIE, uh, WHO, and FAO, and tried to understand whether there was con con uh, concurrence or convergence between both the definitions, the mm -hmm. list, of the critically important antibiotics, uh, antimicrobials, but also the definitions. And uh, quite frankly, Peter, and we, we are having this conversation with you and the other organizations, there is a need to bring coherence at the, at the global level because the guidance for national level then becomes that much clearer because otherwise we will find that, you know, our health ministry versus our agriculture ministry have different uh, pieces. And um, in India, we are seeing huge interest. I mean, I have to say that, um, and also in other developing, um, other emerging countries, the, the interest is clear because we see it in our self-interest. And we see the fact that, you know, for us, it is a need to be able to leapfrog, to move to food production without the use. And how can we do so? So I think there is, and uh, this agenda brings us together. And I think it's important for us to work together on it and to find the solutions together, both globally and nationally. Thank you so much, Sunita, for bringing it up. For the public, there is a report that was done by the Center for Science and Environment in India. Sunita is the Director General, which is comparing the guidance that the FAO, OIE, mm -hmm. and WHO are issuing for use of antibiotics in food-producing animals. And correctly, she comes up is, the guidance is not aligned. OIE is saying something different than WHO is saying, and FAO again is saying something slightly different than the other two. And well, then of course it's easy that for, I mean, it's not easy because people in, in national level, you say, well, which, which guidance do we take? WHO or, or FAO or OIE? So and, are you going to sort it out? Yes, I do. Good, <laughs> great. Well done, Together Sunita. with FAO. Another win. Yes. <laughs> so, so we have it on the list. Another win, exactly. Yeah. Good. No, I think it's really, I, the, the report is really fascinating. It really shows um, that there are discrepancies. And I mean, this is technical. So in the revision of the list, we are looking particularly at the macrolides, you know, how important are they really for use in humans? Because they are also important for veterinary use. But of course, you have to understand when as WHO, we issued our guidelines for, for use of antibiotics in food producing animals, we were praised by some governments in Northern Europe. And there were some other governments who really hated it and said, this is not scientific, you shouldn't do it, you're WHO, stay away from the animals, this is not your job, you are not veterinarians. And then of course, if you look how organizations are governed, we are by, governed by ministries of health. So they basically, they liked it. The ministries of Agri agriculture, who are the governing bodies of the OIE, of you know, they have a different pressure. So it's also an issue about lobbying and power of so industrial Peter, associations. The GLG yeah. would like you, FAO, and OIE to sort this out. Yeah. Look forwards, not backwards. We've had some problems. We need to sort it. We also need recognition. I want to pick up on something that Sunita said earlier that with development, countries are going to use more antibiotics. Yep. Their people are not getting enough antibiotics they need to treat them when they're sick, let alone the animals. So we've got to accept antibiotic use across the world is going to go up, particularly in the low in and middle income countries, and think how, when they have such high levels of AMR, we can support them in stewardship, whether it's um, in the human, or the animal side. And the element we haven't talked about today, um, uh, because Sunita brought in rich versus poor, but there is an intergenerational issue here that I worry about. What are we bequeathing our children and, and our grandchildren in terms of effective antibiotics, effective food systems, and 
um, I'm sure Sunita will say it better than me, a poisoned environment. Thank you, Celis. You can, you can see WHO is a member states governed organization. So when the UK tells us what we do, we are going to execute. We'll be there. <laughs> um, and you can be sure they are going to follow up. No, but really, I think we made, and, and as Sally said, she's also, as Lothar, a member of the Global Leaders Group and AMR, and that's what we want this group to do. Tell us and others what we should do to make progress, and progress on the ground that governments in India and authorities can then use, and, and that is something we are happy to do. With that, I turn to Adrian and Lothar. You want to say something before we close? I think we have a couple of minutes left. I'd just like to maybe make a final point, and that is that um, Evan always said that we're waiting for pandemic X and it happened. There's nothing more certain than AMR becoming an increasing problem every single year of our existence to the point that it threatens safe and effective surgery, you know, traumatic injuries and, and populations at, at high risk. And I think, uh, again, I go back to this, what's the actionable metric? What is, what is the galvanizing metric we can we could uh, identify? Because I feel I feel like it's missing. Yeah, I mean, we, we also uh, had the question uh, of a possible effects of COVID on, on AMR. And, and although we don't have too many sound data so far, um, there has been a, a survey which was also led by the Robert Koch Institute because we are um, coordinating these WHO collaborating centers on behalf of uh, WHO AMR surveillance. And we received responses from 73 countries and most reported that their partnership funding and staffing for AMR were negatively affected, obviously, by COVID-19 pandemic, because uh, uh, also as the availability of reagents and consumables also, clearly that, that uh, this is all these side effects. And uh, um, so we we also we 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 fear, of course, that in addition the the use of antimicrobials has increased in certain areas in the hospital areas, obviously because there are so many infectious in the pulmonary infections. There will be also the the the, the so-called stewardship programs. They will have failed more often uh, during this pandemic. So I guess oh, I, I I guess we all agree that the antibiotic resistance uh, will speed up basically through this. So this is a, an indirect effect of COVID-19 pandemic, and which again shows how interconnected all these different areas of, of infectious diseases are. And this is why prevention is so important, stewardship programs are so important. And, and this is, I mean, this is all this, you know, this bottom stuff that has to be done. I mean, we all know it, we know, we have to teach uh, medical students, we have to teach all the medical persons how to manage it. And, and this is all uh, something we have to do and we have to, uh, we, to, to be resilient to deliver. And, and, and we know there's so much to do. And uh, so basically all these efforts do not only help when it comes to AMR, but in addition, we have to reduce the number of infected people by all these hygienic sanitation methods. And this is, always coming back to this very, very generic tools that are all known, and we have to improve the living conditions of people in the world. That, that's very, very clear. Yeah? We all profit from it. Thank you, Lothar and Adrian. Um, a few last words, Sally, before I give the floor to Sunita. So I think what we've all been discussing shows that we've got to broaden the ownership of antimicrobial resistance and bring in not just students, but civil society in a big way. Um, the younger people, we don't have a patient voice, which drove a lot of uh, the change for HIV and other things. So we need to bring in patients uh, from all across the board who will be suffering if we don't get it right and recognize that no one is safe until we're all safe. And finally, there is another group that have a role in this that we're beginning to work with, they're the investors, mm. the people who invest in the food chains, invest in the environment, invest in our health systems. And we can work with them as well as with consumers to see how to change our society because this needs everyone and it needs our young in particular. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. And Sunita, I started with you. Um, 
a few final words. Yeah, I think everyone has said it, but Peter, just to emphasize, you know, the whole question about how do we make AMR, a, a, you know, the, the, a global movement. And to me, there are two major triggers and two major uh, drivers. One is, as Sally just talked about, and just to emphasize that, the consumer. I mean, you know, when uh, CSC tested uh, amounts of antibiotics in uh, poultry in India, uh, the chicken that we were eating, and also in the honey that we were eating, it had a huge impact, huge impact. It changed regulations, it changed consumer, because health is a driver for policies to change. And I think it's important for us to bring the health issue and in terms of two people. And, and, and this is really, I mean, I've seen it in the issue of air pollution. It's when we were able to make people understand the impact of air pollution on their bodies that we got the transformational changes that we needed. So I think it's important for us to keep AMR very simple and straightforward and directly uh, so that people can understand. The second major issue today, Peter, is that, you know, AMR is part of that global package, which is climate change, which is COVID, which is AMR. The three major challenges that the world community has to look at. And that's why it's important to have this dialogue at, between all countries to begin with. Climate change has always been a dialogue in which the rich have spoken and the poor have listened. I think the AMR dialogue must not start with that. I see the difference in my own country. I have, we have no resistance when we talk about AMR. I see more uh, resistance when I talk to the food producing industry of the US, when I talk to uh, industrialized food producing industry, than there is from um, the industry in our part of the world. So I think it's important for this dialogue to stay as a dialogue of equals, as a dialogue which believes strongly in, in interdependent world and that equity between nations and between generations is critical. And I think if we can keep that as the, as, as the foundation for this, we would not go off track. Thank you so much, Sunita, for this strong statement. And with that, I think we are ending this panel discussion. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to the panelists um, for the very interesting contributions. And I let you enjoy the rest of the World Health Summit. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you.